Thank you, Dustin. Hey, give a round of applause for Dustin. Put some energy into it. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. This is, the, this is the weakest crowd I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm just giving you guys a hard time. Hey, listen, first off, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for the invite, Frank. I am um, I'm super busy. All right, like, I'm not putting myself at a different platform. I'm just telling you I am jacked up until late into 2020. But uh, for Frank and fellow uh, ex-Toronto officers, we always make time to come in, especially when it comes down to talking to potentially uh, future police officers. And I'll tell you why that's so important for us is because what I do, we're at the leading edge in the world. We are in territories that in the entire world, I'm getting phone calls on a weekly basis from places like Sweden, all over the United States, all over South America, all over Canada, uh, all over the United Kingdom saying, hey, what are you guys doing over there? Because we have some relative success in exploring different spaces. And those different spaces are getting gang members out of gangs. Right? We're, we're actively pursuing relationships with gang members not in terms of finding out what's happening on the inside to go find informants, which is an essential part of law enforcement, but more to say, hey, all that stuff doesn't matter right now. What matters is, how do we get you out of here? How do we get it so that you're not gonna get shot tomorrow or you're not gonna shoot anybody? And how can we get you on the track to something productive in your lifestyle? And I'll tell you kind of where that came from and a little bit of my upbringing so you can have that. But as this goes on, I really want this to be a conversation, all right, because it's, important to have a conversation about these things. It's important to get some stuff out of your head. Um, so in this room here, uh, out of however many people that are here, how many of you by raising hands are looking to get into policing at some point in your future? <laughs> All right, and for those of you who don't have your hands up, uh, how many of you want to get in the legal field in some representative? Is that as a lawyer? Anybody's a lawyer? Hands up if you want to go as a lawyer? Yeah, <laughs> lawyer. And then for those who put their hand up, for something else in the legal field, uh, what is it? So I'll ask you, young lady. Courthouse? courthouse but what exactly in a courthouse would you like to do? Um, maybe working with the bar attorney's office, working with legal aid. Mm -hmm. So legal aid? Or probation? Perfect. Legal aid or probation. And what else for those other people that don't want to? I was going to say youth probation. Youth, youth probation as a probation officer. What about uh, any other things in the industry? Yes, ma'am. Um, social work with at risk youth. Social work with at risk youth. Anybody else? Some people don't want to say. Right, so I'll ask you all here, when we all talk about that here, you can take a look around this room. I've traveled the entire world, all right? I have, legitimately. I just came back from Thailand uh, last week. I'm still recovering from the jet lag. A uh, beautiful place. But when I go to these places, I go like right to the heart. All right, I mean, I do the touristy things, but I get right into the heart. I went to Mexico City, and I went straight to like the state of Mexico, right in the city, and that was a wild, wild experience. First off, everybody thought I was the tallest Mexican in Mexico. <laughs> Not even Mexican, but I got it. And I just said, you know, I'm going to run with this. And the second off, you really get a global picture. And every time I come back home and I come to Toronto, I take a look around. And if you take a look around in this room, for those of you who haven't had the luxury to travel, what we're seeing in this room right now is so unique in this entire world. It's absolutely mind-boggling. You know, I didn't appreciate it until I really got to see the rest of the world and got to see what's happening in different places. And coming back, I get to see it here. Every place I've traveled, I've had some understanding of the country I'm going into, only because I'm from Toronto. So it's like if I go to Afghanistan, I know Afghani people. If I go to Thailand, I know Thai people. If I go to China, I know Chinese people. I kind of know what to expect based on that culture. But when I get down there, if you take a look in this room, everybody in this room, even though some of you want to be police officers and some of you don't, I think it's agreed upon that even if you didn't voice why you want to do what you want to do, that it's important we all understand that along the same page here, does anybody here want to get into a profession where they want to hurt somebody? Is anybody here really want to get into a profession where at the stage primarily you're motivated by the amount of money you're going to make. I'll ask you that right now. When, when I asked you kind of what you wanted to do here, you guys all gave me specific things, right? I want to be a probation officer. I want to be a youth worker. I want to be a, working in the courts and duty aids. Some of you want to be a police officer, but nobody said here I want to be a millionaire. I mean, is that a bonus? For sure. For sure, an absolute bonus. But I'm going to break it to you right now. If you're going to get into these fields, you're never going to be a millionaire just by doing this. Right, the goal is you want to get into something, be so good at it that you raise your own value, which is a whole other topic. But the point I bring that up and why I look in this room and I say, hey, it's important to acknowledge that is when you're dealing with gang members, they are no different than exactly what we have in this room. All right, they are not different with it at all. When I first got into policing, <coughs> it was an uphill battle for me. All right, I got rejected uh, five times before I got hired by Toronto Police. Right, uh, five times I got that solid rejection. And for me, I'm wired similar to some of you in this room where 
Um, I'm so, people would have called it stubborn at the time. Now I understand that it's not stubborn, it's called being driven. I knew what I wanted, and every time somebody told me no, I got so pissed off about it, I just drove back at it. All right, now I can acknowledge that, but when I was at your age, I never understood what the hell was happening. Everybody around me said, like, you're so stubborn, you gotta learn how to take no. I just never understood what that meant. So for me, um, growing up, everybody says it because everybody, it's true for everybody. Everybody says, listen, man, I never had a perfect childhood. Here, who here has had a perfect childhood? <laughs> Nobody. All right, that's the point. Nobody's had a perfect childhood. I wasn't an exception to that rule either. But when I grew up, I had a best friend. And my best friend, he was uh, in grade six. We absolutely hated each other. His name was Vic. All right, absolutely hated each other. And I think we hated each other because at that time, he was a big Indian guy and I was a big Indian guy. And in our school, there could only be one big Indian guy. So we just had this problem. All right, so grade six, grade seven, grade eight, we had problems. You had two big guys that were both kind of meatheads and stubborn. And uh, we just did not get along. And then all of a sudden, grade nine hit. And <laughs> when grade nine hit, we both wanted to play football. So we were the only colored guys uh, at that time that were kind of playing football uh, where I grew up. So we jumped on the team. And I'm not saying color matters, all right? But what I'm saying is at that time, it really bonded us together. So then we became best friends, all right? We, we were inseparable. I mean, we did everything. Prior to becoming a police officer, I had 35 jobs and I got hired at 23. All right, so I had 35 jobs from the age of 15. Um, my parents were immigrants to this country. They went through a tremendous amount of bullshit uh, to be able to make it happen. They made it happen, and when I was at home, my parents always said a couple things, but one of the things that stands out the most is they said, listen, if you ever come home in handcuffs or your teacher calls, you're leaving here in an ambulance, all right? And they meant it. But Vic and I, we become best friends, and then all of a sudden at 18, we both hit 18. <laughs> I still remember he turned 18 on April 10th, and on April 18th, he calls me up. He says, man, I got charged. I said, man, you got charged for what? And what happened was his younger brother was coming home from school, and he was just coming home from school, um, he comes home crying and he says, hey man, some guys beat me up in the park and they call me all these racist terms and they beat me up and he came home crying and he was like eight years younger than us and Vic was a monster, all right? He was like six foot three, 280 pounds. Like when I said we were big, no, no, he was big, but I thought I was big. So I acted like I was big, which meant everybody thought I was big. All right, that's how it worked out. So he was actually legitimately big. And he goes back to that park and he sees everybody and he sees the, the group of kids who did this to his younger brother. And he says, listen, if any of you touch my brother again, I'll kill you. And these kids went home, told their parents, they called the police. Vic got arrested and charged. Wow. Right, so then that's us, right? 18, we do that. Now Vic and I uh, both meet as we end up both trying to go to university. I end up going to York. He went to McMaster. We both kind of flunk out after two years. Uh, and then our third year, we both take it off, all right? We're both like, listen, man, we kind of failed, quote unquote, took it off uh, out of university. And uh, we were working all these crazy jobs. From the age of 18 to 22, I worked as a bouncer in all the nightclubs in downtown Toronto. So I started when I was 18. And when I got into the game, we had moved everywhere. And when you move everywhere in the nightclub industry, you're connected to everything and everybody. When I was like 18 to 22, working not only in downtown Toronto, all these nightclub districts, I had all these weird jobs here and there. I worked in factories. I worked as a personal trainer. I worked as, uh, I worked in some nutrition store. I worked at Toys R Us. Like, I had, I had every job you could think of, and every job I had, I had it with Vic. Uh, first time I held a gun, I was 15 years old. I was in school. And what happens, I was in school, we were in this class, and it was, uh, funny enough, it was uh, grade 11 law, and we had a dual class. So it was like this class, and there's another class there, and we always sat at the back, right? Whatever, I don't know why we did that, but that's what the garbage we did. So we sat at the back, and there was a door, and one day underneath that door slides a $100 bill, and we just see it going back and forth. So this was almost 20 years ago. And we're yanking it, trying to grab it, grab it. First day we can't get it, the next day we can't get it. The third day I finally yanked the $100 bill out. And I'm like, man, this is, this is a big deal. I got 100 bucks. So I'm already thinking, I was the first guy in my crew to have a license and I had like a beater of a car where we could fit 30 people in that car. <laughs> so my first thing was, man, you gotta get the, the boys together. We're going to McDonald's for lunch. <laughs> or I got a hundred bucks. This is a big deal. Well, the door opens and across from me is this um, big dude, a Jamaican guy from another part of the city. And he had these dreads from here to here. And he was in the 10 year high school plan. All right. He's, he was there for a long time. I was like 15 and this guy was like 22 <laughs> in high school. And he sees me and he's like, yo, give me the money. And his name was, we all just called him King. All right. But he was a legitimate certified gang member. We all knew he was a gang member. But he asked for the money back, so what do I do? 
I give him back his money. <laughs> and then the door shuts. And the next class, another note slides. And now we're, we're friends. All right, so he's sliding notes about whatever, just nonsense. I don't even remember what it was. But at the end of class, he comes by and he grabs me. Uh, and he grabs me and Vic. And he puts his arm around me and he was like super tall. And he goes, hey, man, who's the biggest dope dealer in the school? And I knew who the biggest dope dealer was because I grew up with him too. So I go, listen, man, are you sure you want to know who this guy is? And he's like, yeah, man, I want to know who the biggest dope dealer is. And I go, listen, this guy's like a legitimate like a legitimate guy. I don't think you want problems with him. Like he's really well connected. He goes, no, 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 man. He goes, we're good. Said, what do you mean we're good, man? So he grabs my hand. He puts it on his waist and I pull it out and it's a gun. And I give it back to him and I'm like, oh, are you crazy? And he's like, nah, man, we're good. He's like, you're my soldier now. He goes, we're good. So he walks away. I walk away. And as I'm walking away, my, my chemistry teacher comes out of the corner. She puts her arm around me. And she's like, hey, Ron, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, what's up? She's like, listen, I noticed you and King had become friends. You guys are an odd combination. Is there anything you want to talk about? Like, keep in mind, 30 seconds earlier, I just held a gun in school. As I'm walking around, what do you think I told her? I said, no, I, I said everything's good. <laughs> See, I want you to remember that. You snitched. I want you to remember that. I didn't snitch. <laughs> but I want you to remember that because that's going to be a theme we're going to talk about. All right? So then he puts his arm around me. The teacher comes up. Says, I said, no, man, I'm just helping him with his homework. I said, everything's good. And then over time, what, what King wanted me to do was he wanted me to set up a dope deal. And then he was going to rob the main dope dealer. And then he was going to give us a portion of the money. And he wanted to, like, start dominating that whole area of the neighborhood that we came in. We never followed through on any of that. Once we realized we were soldiers and, and we started to realize, hey, man, at lunch at Domino's, that table started to get bigger and bigger. And we started getting introduced to soldiers. I was like, yo, I'm not into this garbage. Like, this is not for me. It had nothing to do with uh, being afraid of it. I just, when I sat down and actually listened to how they spoke to each other, I'm like, these guys are a bunch of idiots. Like, they're going nowhere in their life. But I was super driven. I was super driven. I didn't even realize that I was driven. I had so many jobs. I could just never say no to anything. Um, by the time I got out of high school, I was school president and class valedictorian. All right. And that is not that I got 100% on anything. I just skated by. I just managed to drive through everything effectively well. And then I got it. And I was like so happy I got it. But here goes back to my family life. So you'd think, all right, my, my, my parents come into my high school graduation. I'm the valedictorian. I was school president. I was a captain of like two or three different sports teams that I played. And I remember at the end of it, I gave my speech. I, I, I give my bullshit thank you to my family who probably did more trauma to me than support, <laughs> right? And then I said thanks to all my teachers who not all of them were great for me, but I had like three or four that were so impactful in my life, which now I value it. At the time, I didn't. And I do it, and I, I say everything to all the people that I grew up with, which I really legitimately cared about. And then I leave, and I go back, and I talk to my dad in the car. And all my friends are going out to eat, <laughs> going out to party. And we get in the car, and I'm like, Dad, can, uh, can we go get something to eat? And he looks at me and goes, for what? And I, go, I was like, just graduate high school. He's, You're supposed to graduate high school. And I got to go home, and I had to break tile for a week. right? So he's like, we got to break the tiles in the kitchen. He goes, we're going to do new stuff. So that was my graduation ceremony. So for me, firing and wiring, I had no expectation of a reward at the end of anything. All right? So then all of a sudden, Vic and I, we hustle through all these jobs. We have no financial support from anybody in our family. Not that they didn't want to offer. We didn't want to take it. I didn't want my parents to have to carry the burden of me anymore. I was a grown ass man. I was now 20 years old. This is not a, it's not a time or a joke. So some of you here who are 18 or 19, the reality is you're not a kid. So I don't know how much more you want to be babied for the rest of your life. The sooner you can get it through your head that you got to drive through this garbage and this shit that's called life, the easier things are going to get for you. But from the very beginning, we were told at a young age, which I don't advocate for, that you got to figure this out on your own. And nobody's going to help you do this. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that now. But at the time, listen, it comes with a ton of baggage that you're going to have to deal with later in life. But anyway, so Vic and I, we drive through this. We get all these crazy jobs. And now we realize, because we had coaches that were cops, um, that, hey, you know what? I really like how they carry themselves. They're in shape. They're professional. They're very dedicated. They're super intense. And that's me. That's my language. All right? I do everything with passion. There's... As far as I can look back, I don't do anything without passion. And people will say, man, it just looks like you found your calling. I don't know what my calling is, but I don't see the point in not doing anything that you're not committed about. You're just wasting your own time. And time is not for any of us. All right? You may look at me now and say, man, I got a 37-year-old, really handsome police officer in front of me. 
but that's going to come for you really quick. And you might be me standing in front of a class of people just like you, not as good looking, unfortunately, for you guys. <laughs> so Vic and I, now we become 21, and we realize, man, this is what we want to do. All right, But I'd known before. I'd applied when I was 19. I got rejected. I applied when I was 20. I got rejected. I applied when I was 21, got rejected. 22, got rejected. 22, got rejected again. And then 23, my first application to Toronto Police, I got hired. Or I got hired. And here's the crazy thing. Vic kept applying. But for me, all the shit that I got into as a kid, I had done so much from my first police rejection letter to the time I got to my fifth one that I separated from the pack. Eventually, I get hired. And when I get hired by Toronto, this is where I'll give Toronto Police a lot of credit, man. They, I don't know how it is now, all right, because it was just 13 years ago. But when I got hired by Toronto Police, I, what I found so different about my recruiters was they were looking for every reason to hire me when every other police service I'd applied to was looking for every reason not to hire me. So the second I hit one box where there's a cross, they're like, get out of here, sorry, not happening for you. But Toronto was like, okay, you didn't have this box, but you do have this. All right, you, you cross this off, but you, you do have this, so we can work with you there. And they gave me an opportunity, I'm really thankful for that opportunity, but for Vic, stuff didn't pan out that well. All right, he, um, we, we started to have a divide at that point there. All right, and the divide was, I started to actually start to, to get involved in, in what I considered at the time my dream. And I was like, man, I can't believe I'm actually going to become a cop. Like, this is crazy. So even when I got hired, I still remember exactly where I was. I, I still remember that phone call. I still remember the feeling I had. And I remember it felt too good to be true. And we hear that all the time. But when you actually feel something too good to be true, it, the colors start to brighten. Things start to change. And that's when you're like, Oh my goodness, this is the beginning of something. So I had that feeling. Well, Vic never got that feeling. Right? His history and the stuff we had done, he never grew out of it. Or he never grew out of it. And it wasn't until way later on, like at this stage here, when I look back at what happened with Vic and what happened with me, the key differences that we had. So anyways, I get into policing. Vic stays in the uh, organized crime route. And then naturally, we have a divide. Right? We had a falling out, which we kept very private. Uh, for many reasons, but we never told like the rest of our social circle. We never said we had a falling out. We just both agreed this is not going to work anymore, All right? So there's a lot of heartache with that, but we separate. And as we separate, over the years of 13 years, I end up getting into policing. And when I first started in policing, I started in the city's West End in Rexdale in 23 Division. I spent two years on the road. And then after that, we had the school resource officer program back in 2008, and I volunteered for that. And when I did it, I did it in a very heavily gang impacted school at the time. Anybody from the West End here? Yeah, so I was a school officer at North Albion Collegiate or NACI. Right, so I jumped into there. And when I got in there, I, I started a football program and I coached uh, 80 kids for two years, three years. And then I left there and I went to our police headquarters and I worked doing citywide stuff with school officers. Then I left there and I went to a 14 division, which is right downtown Toronto, which I went from a gang area to a very heavily drug infested area. And then I worked in the vice unit there, which is like undercover where you focus on drugs, robberies, and prostitution and liquor offenses. And then I got the phone call to go up to Guns and Gangs. All right, and that phone call, uh, Guns and Gangs in Toronto Police Service, it, you don't apply there. You got to get called. That's how it works. It's not like they have a job posting for the Gun and Gang Task Force or our drug squad or some of our specialized elite units. They don't put it up there and everybody can apply. You have to prove yourself to be suitable to come and work in this high stress and high pressure environment where lives and decisions matter every second of the day. So you gotta be a high pressure player. So I got the phone call to come up and it happened kind of by accident. And I said, yes, because that's the way I'm wired. All right, I'm, I'm, I have a fear of missing out. All right, they say FOMO. So I always feel like whenever somebody gives me an opportunity and I don't say n yes, I'm gonna screw myself. I should have said yes. So I always said yes to everything. So I said, yes, I go up to Guns and Gangs and for two years, working almost 80 hours a week, nonstop, smashing in doors and finding gang members and getting in guns and doing these massive search warrants and raids and all these, you know, on the police and cool projects, I just started to get really disconnected with all of it. All right, I really did. I'm married, I have two kids, and when I started to arrest people that reminded me of myself and reminded me of Vic and reminded me of king and some other guys and all these guys that i grew up with that we've known each other since we're like in grade five that i'm lucky to get out and these guys got stuck in this horrible lifestyle i started to become really detached and really i started asking myself like yo how many times are we going to do this for me 
I'm like, how many more doors am I going to kick in? How many more bad guys am I going to arrest? How many more search warrants are we going to write? How many more drugs am I going to seize? Like, how many more guns am I going to find? Like, when is this ever going to end? And I just detached. And I, I left Guns and Gangs. And I said, I really value what they do. And what they do, don't get me wrong, it's absolutely necessary. It's absolutely important. It has to be done. But for me, I was past it now. And I left. And that was the first time I ever left something on my own. So that was like four and a half years ago. So I left on my own. And I said, you know what? No longer am I saying yes to everything. I did that. I had to spend 10 years saying yes to everything because you're going to miss out on stuff. So you got to earn that respect. You have to earn your thick skin. You got to earn your scars. So I thought I earned them at that point. So I left and I said, you know what? Thank you. I'm gone. And when I left and when you leave any elite specialized unit in policing, which only 1% of the police population will ever get to work in, there's kind of a hidden rule. And the hidden rule is, it's not even a rule, it's a rumor or it's bullshit or a conspiracy is once you leave these specialized units, you're never going to be allowed to come back. It's not true. Within two months, they called me and said, you want to come back. You know, within three months, they called me and said, you want to come back. And I still stayed committed and I said, you know what? I'm not going to come back. But six months later, I get a phone call, and it's my boss now who's not here, Jason Kondo. And he calls me up, and he says, hey, Ron, listen, man, um, we're starting something new here. Would you be interested in doing it? And keep in mind, everything I just told you, I kept it a secret up until three years ago. I never told anybody. No police officer that I work with ever knew about my upbringing. Nobody knew about my connections. I mean, they popped up. Don't get me wrong. They popped up a few times. I had to arrest, unfortunately, a few friends of mine that were involved in the mafia that I grew up with. And that I worked with, I've had to arrest a few friends of mine that have done violent offenses. It happens. It's just the way the city works. You're going to run into people. And in those circumstances, everything was kept very hush-hush. But I kept who I was or where I came from very quiet. But then the phone call happens. And the phone call is, Ron, listen, there's been a conversation up top. And we got a new idea. And uh, we think it might be something you're interested in. All right? And I was very lucky. Guns and Gangs wanted me to come back. And what the idea was, was that it came down from our deputy chief. And those of you who aren't familiar with the policing ranking structure, honestly, half of it, who cares? It doesn't even matter. But in this case here, uh, deputy chief is like a vice president of a company, right? So the chief is the president. Well, Toronto Police has four vice presidents. Those are deputy chiefs. And one of them is in charge of detective operations or specialized operations command, which is all that cool stuff. So he calls the guns and gangs and he says, listen, we want to expand this strategy. And what we want to do is we want to get gang members out of gangs. Every year over the last 15 years, we do these major raids, we do these warrants, we catch all these people doing these shootings and have possession of drugs, but those numbers don't change. In fact, those numbers have been increasing. So if you actually look at it from an operational lens, yeah, we're doing a good job. We're getting hundreds of guns off of the street, thousands of kilograms of dope off of the street that are killing people. But these numbers aren't changing. We have to evolve. So do you want to come in and try to figure out a way how to get gang members out of gangs? And I said, yeah, 100%. That for me was up my alley. Now for the first time, I was picking and choosing what I wanted to do. When I first left Guns and Gangs, and I told you that I'd said yes to everything, I'd left on my own for the first time. I said, you know what? I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to reset. I went right back to the streets. I was a street cop again, and I loved it. I really loved it. And when I was on there, every week I was getting phone calls to come in all these other different places, and every week I'd say, no, thank you. And I had such a, a weight lifted off of my shoulder. But when this came up, something about me said, yeah, you got to do this. So January of 2017 is when we started. I hadn't seen Vic in maybe, well, I'd seen him maybe 10 times in the last 10 years prior to that. And we'd see each other at different things, all right? Or, or he would drop my name somewhere and I'd have to show up and we'd have to figure things out a little bit. So I'd run into him a few times and everything was good. Well, January of 2017, I get into this to get gang members out of gangs. And then in February 2017, I get a phone call from a girl I grew up with in high school. She calls me up. She's like, hey, Ron, what's up? I said, hey, what's going on? I haven't talked to you in a couple of years. Like, what are you calling me for? She says, have you heard? I said, no. She says, uh, Vic's dead. Oh. Yeah. So Vic hung himself in jail. Yeah. So February hits. Now my phone blows up. All the guys I grew up with that didn't know him and I had separated, all call me to find out what happened. Hey, man, what happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? I get phone calls from other guys I grew up with that are police officers that had said, don't go to the police funeral. Like, don't go to the funeral. It's not a good look for you. You're a cop. You can't show up at this guy's funeral. Well, I went anyways. And when I showed up at the funeral, I didn't go for who he became. I went for who he was. I didn't, uh, well, who he became, I'm not saying I tolerate it. I'm not saying I'm okay with it. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying I, I didn't know that guy. I don't know who this guy was, but I knew the other guy. We grew up together. We did everything together. Everything together. 
So I went to the funeral, and as soon as I get to the funeral, the first person I see who I haven't seen in 10 years is his mom. His mom runs, gives me hugs, and says, why did you leave my son? So I go around, and at the funeral, there's like 400 people there, half of which I knew, half of which I didn't know. The other half I didn't know was all the new people. The other half I did know, when I went around that room, and now I went back to cop mode, and now I was pissed. All right, I went back to that drive mode of what happened? Like, what, what happened in the last 10 years? How did this stay such a secret from everybody? Yo, know, everybody else was calling me up and telling me weird stuff about him, right? They'd be like, listen, man, he became a big-time guy. Like, big-time guy. And I didn't know what that meant. And to be honest, I didn't want to know. I don't want to get involved in that mess, man. I said, you know what? I don't want to hear it. But people would say, yo, man, he's, he's like a big-time guy now. I was like, nah, man, like, don't tell me. I don't, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to get involved. But when I showed up, now I flipped that switch, right? And now I was on everybody. I pulled everybody aside. What happened? Who, like, what, what is going on here? And you know what everybody did? Not one person to this day. That's still an unsolved murder. So it was a rough time for me for a year or so. I had to refigure things out a little bit, but I went back to that drive mode. I went back to that drive mode. All right, sometimes in life, stuff's going to happen to all of us, and we're going to sit there, and you're going to be miserable for a day, for a week, for a month. For some of us in this room, I've been miserable since 16. Right? And then you ask me, said, hey, man, you know, why are you in such a shit attitude all the time? You're like, well, when I was 16, this happened to me. I got no time for those people, man. I'm sorry. All right? I've been that person. I know what that feels like. But you got to wake up, man. Nothing is going to change. So sometimes when stuff happens to you and you're in such a bummer mood out of it, it really pushes you down. You can sit there and live in that moment for five more years, or you can decide to make a reason for it. So I decided to make a reason for it. So my reason was what I'm doing now is finding kids like Vic, kids like myself that are on that path to gang involvement, that are entrenched in gangs and saying, hey man, you don't have to do this. There's so much more out there for you. But the challenge becomes, as a police officer, how do you do it? How do you do it? So I'll ask you in this room here, let's pretend we are going to find a gang member and we're going to change their life and we're going to implant some new motivation. We're going to switch that mindset up. We're going to add some reality to what the fuck is actually going on. Right, so excuse my language, but that's just the way it is. Because right, we're dealing with real life here. This is not, this is not a, uh, a game of, of tag here. We're not playing chess. We're, we're playing a game of guns and gangs. So I'll ask you here, and this is kind of where we have to start off with as an organization, when they have that sentence to you and they say to you, how do you get a gang member out of a gang? And that's all I was given to figure this out. There's a couple things you got to do first, and I want you to put yourself in the mindset of a police officer and taking into account many different things. Taking into account stigmas, stereotypes that go both ways. What are the stigmas and stereotypes that law enforcement and the general public have on gangs? And what are the stigmas and stereotypes that the community, especially gang impact communities, have back on law enforcement? So one of the first things we have to do is we have to develop two things, all right? And those two things are, are very separate. And I'm gonna explain to you what they are. So there's two things you always gotta keep your mindset focused on. One of those things is subjective and one of those things is objective. Does anybody know the difference of those? Subjective versus objective? So here, <clears throat> if I were to tell you I don't like ice cream, I don't like cookie and crease ice cream, okay? I don't, I think it's disgusting. And I think if you like it, you might be part of ISIS, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's how gross cookies and creams ice cream is to me. You're from a different planet if you like it. Is that a subjective or objective opinion? That's a subjective opinion. That opinion is based off of my experience. That opinion is based off of my palate, but that's not a universal truth. That's a subjective opinion unique to me. Now, objective opinion is I do not like desserts that contain, or sorry, not I do not like dessert. Desserts that contain milk products, um, this is a mix of objective or subjective, are not my cup of tea. All right, so there's the objective one that, hey, this in fact, ice cream does in fact include milk. That's objective. That's a fact. You can't deny that. All right, that's there. The subjective part is, I don't like milk. So as law enforcement, when we're looking at gang members and gangs and how to get these guys out of gangs, what's the subjective lens of identifying a gang member? So what's that subjective? Subjective being your personal experience, right? So your personal experience now in this room, and let's talk openly and honestly, and I do this with every organization, every group of people I speak to, every community, and, and we're, we're, we're deep in these communities, and we have a lot of these uh, town halls happening right now where we're engaged in these communities and we're finding what's actually happening. So here, 
Uh, what I want you to do is I want you to think with openness and honesty, and I hope in this room as all as adults we can respect that and we can figure things out from here, but if I were to ask you in your personal opinions right now to describe experiences you've had with people that are either gang members or people you believe to be gang members, what would those be? And there, there's no wrong answer. This is kind of like a rhetorical question. This is kind of me canvassing to say, okay, what, what does the experience look like for people on that side of the room? You're around drugs, right? So that's an that's an a subjective opinion too, right? Or maybe objective, but you've had that experience, I'm assuming, right? Sorry, you've had that experience being around drugs with gang members. What else? No guns and crackheads. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I thank you for saying the word crackhead, and I'll tell you why. Is because that's what we're all thinking, right? And uh, listen, man, if we're not going to be open and honest here in this room, we're never going to get to a solution. We're just going to make each other feel good. I'm not in the business of making each other feel good. I'm in the business of finding a real solution. And if in finding the real solution, some people are upset about it, that's too bad. It's not my problem. So I appreciate you using the word crackhead. Thank you. So crackhead, drugs, guns. What else? Dangerous. Dangerous. So explain dangerous to me. Yeah, not somebody you could trust. You never know. Right? You guys said what? Negativity? Said bad vibes. Bad vibes? You feel it. Has anybody been around somebody and you just feel that negativity? Yeah. You, you know what that is? You know what else that is? That's called trauma. Right? That's called trauma coming up. But if I ask you this, we're going to do this little example here, all right? Here's the example. We've got to do two things. So we know subjective, objective. We always got to keep that in mind. As a government organization, as a police officer, I have to always be objective. I have to catch myself when I'm being subjective. Because my experiences might lie to me, they might not be the universal truth. 100% true. So I want you to think of this. We have to do two things now. So they tell me, you got to find a gang member, get him out of a gang. Now i got to make this work. So there's two things i got to do. One, I have to know what a gang member looks like. Or, or how do I identify a gang member objectively, not based on my opinion. And the second part is i got to find a location to go. So we're going to do this little exercise in this class here. we got one hour. we got one hour. We're going to speed this up considerably to make it work. If I tell you we had one hour now in this room, uh, people, how many people here from the west side of the city? How many people from the east? A whole lot of people in the east. Side. North side of the city, like up in North York, and then south side right by downtown on Lakeshore. None of those rich people are here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got people from all over. So we have, listen, we, and then people outside of the city. People outside of the city. All right, perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, and I want you to think of this. So now we have a good gamut. We have a good understanding of the city in this room. Number one, we're going to start with location. We're going we're gonna to save a gang member today. I'm going to go in my pocket. I'm going to pull out a magic pill. And this magic pill, it's amazing. We're going to give it to this person we find today. When we find this person, not only are we going to give it to them, they're going to be a gang member. And as soon as they swallow this pill, their life is going to change. They're going to become instantly an, an, a genius. They're going to become an entrepreneur. They are going to come from a gang impacted neighborhood they're going to create thousands of high paying jobs they're going to have a statue built out for them they're going to go and be a multi-billionaire and then come back to the neighborhood that they were in and be a role model for thousands of generations and thousands of kids to say this guy did it or girl did it but we got to find them we're going to give them this magic pill so number one where do we go in the city give me an intersection jana finch. finch i didn't even finish my sentence jana finch <laughs> We're super excited, right? Or, or somebody had said before, Finch and Jane, to try to be nice about it. Rexdale, Jenna Finch. For this, because Jenna Finch, sorry, what else are we going to say? I said Galloway-Malvern. Galloway-Malvern, that's the east side of the city. Brampton. But every, Sorry? Jamestown. Jamestown. Brampton. Yeah, Brampton's rough. Wellesley, yeah, down by Sherbourne, all those places. So look, we said a whole bunch of gang areas, right? But for the sake of this, we're going to pick one that we're all kind of good with in terms of we're going to change this person's life. we got to go. So let's go with uh, Jane and Finch, all right, because that seems to be the one that pops up the most. So I go down there to Jane and Finch, and now I have to find somebody who's a gang member in there, and i got to put this pill down their throat, and we're going to change their life. We're going we're gonna to do this. Guys, we are doing this. As a room, we found the place we're going to go to. Now, is this person we're looking at, either be a boy or girl? We're down to 30 minutes now. We have time. is not on our side. 30 minutes, is this person a boy or a girl? Boy. It's a boy, all right, and how old roughly? 25. 23, 25? 18, 18, 22, she says we'll be good, out of high school. So let's go 18 to 22. 
18 to 22, perfect. Okay, and what type of clothing do they wear? Guys, we've got 15 minutes, man. Urban clothing. Define urban clothing to me. She said, bag it closer. Yes, sir. Sorry, guys. I can't. Sorry, guys. I gotta keep. I can't hear this gentleman here. Sorry, designer clothes. Give me some labels like designer. Gucci. Eve Laurent, he said Jordans. So Jordans on the shoes. Do they have? A, do they have a nice champion cross back? Yeah. Do they got air earbuds in? One of them in, one of them out. How many cell phones does this person have? What about jewelry? A couple chains. Are they real or are they fake? Cubit zirconia right here. Okay, this is real, but this is uh, this is not. All right. What about tattoos? Any tattoos? Yeah, yeah, perfect. What kind of tattoos? You put the you put the neck tattoo. Does this neck tattoo say? Does, does it say? Does this neck tattoo say peace and love? Does this neck tattoo say Pikachu? So tattoos, right? Perfect. And what about hair and clothing? Braids. What about hat? Oh, you got a hat or something like that? Do rag. Do rag. Perfect. All right. Now, what skin color is this person? No. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute here. This is my. This is my absolute favorite part of this whole thing, because we got thousands of things about this person, except for the skin color. Okay, so hold off. Let's have the discussion here. Y young lady, go ahead. Everyone goes to, everyone's a young to the old who's African American, so I'm just going to say let's make him a white man. Okay. Because white people can be, you know. Sure. Okay, but let me repaint the picture here, right? And, and listen, she's not wrong. <laughs> listen, wait a minute, wait a minute. Guys, I want you, I just want to repaint the picture. We got five minutes left in this scenario. We're in Jane and Finch. We got this 18 to 22 year old kid. Champion bag, headphones in, multiple chains, cubic zirconias, bodied up, clothing is all nice, Jordan's all that stuff. All right? And now we're in Jana Finch, and I'm looking for a white kid there. Are we good with that? No. I get, this pill is going to change this person's life and their community. It has to be black. Oh. Hold on a second. Hold on. Guys, wait a minute. Girls, girls and, and gentlemen here. And ladies and gentlemen here, have a minute, have a minute. Indians, we only are in Bollywood films. That's all we do. <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, no, yeah, girl, uh, we're all going to have a chance to voice our opinions because the point of this, the point of this exactly is to have these discussions. Okay, so young lady, you were saying. Yeah, so especially if you're going to go to Jane Finch with a good yes, sister. Yes, ma'am. And five TVs, you cannot look for white because there's no white. Okay, yes, ma'am. And then uh, in the back, you had a different opinion? Me? Uh, uh, you had a different opinion in the back? Yes. Did you have a different opinion or same opinion? I just said, like, maybe not too pinpoint near that. Yeah, yeah, maybe not too pinpoint. Don't know. Yeah. And I mean, there's some young people that are really sharp. This yes. Is Yeah. So <clears throat> here's the thing. All right. This is a rhetoric. Nobody is right or always wrong. If you actually look at the any disagreements in this room, what are we disagreeing on? We're disagreeing on the solution to a problem. All right. So there's nothing to say that one is right and one is wrong is to say that if, if in the process of finding solutions, and this is something we have to learn very early on, we're going to get caught up in our conversations as to who's offended, who's not offended, who is uh, right, who is wrong, who is who is not going to tell the truth, who's not going to tell the truth. We can argue this forever, but while we're arguing here, guess what's happening in the hood? Kids are getting shot and killed. Kids are shooting each other. There's innocent people being killed in drive-by shootings. And we, we can't get over our own ego to say, I feel like a certain way. And, and the point of that was we had to have that realization very early on because initially when we looked at gang members, we had to say, well, well who are we looking at? Like, who are we looking at? And we have to get out of the subjective lens and go to the objective. And here's, 
here's a part that is a part of a bigger picture of really organizational change and this is like the future of policing and that's why I say um, we're lucky to be the, the really at the forefront of the entire world on how we're thinking about things how we're engaging people and how we're doing things all right and this is where things get a little dicey so we do these <laughs> gang prevention town halls every week we do one or two of them and we're in the lowest equitable neighborhoods in the city there's 31 of them the city got divided up into 140 neighborhoods are you all familiar with that <coughs> so it's important to know for anybody who wants to work in the city of toronto in any aspect i'm not talking just policing i want to talk social services i'm talking you know probation parole i'm talking you know duty camp anybody who wants to work in the city of toronto you got to know this stuff and this is the stuff you got to know the city a couple of years ago got broken down into low equitable neighborhoods or, or equitable neighborhoods and all that means is they broke down the city in 140 quadrants and they had individual neighborhoods that were kind of signed off and how they broke these down is they looked at these neighborhoods and they looked at what is the median income of the home what does the family structure look like uh, what are the demographics of the area uh, what are the immigration statuses are? What is the access to economic opportunity for these neighborhoods? And they gave them a score. And when they have these scorings, they had 140 neighborhoods. Well, 31 of these neighborhoods were considered low equitable areas. 31 in the entire city. So out of 140, 31 of them, they said, hey, these ones are, are a little too below any sort of acceptable standard for us. So the city of Toronto says in 2020, through <laughs> a strategy called the Toronto Strong Neighborhood Strategy, they're gonna invest millions of dollars as well as resources into these communities to help bring them back up. So for us, when we have to look at objective things as to where are we gonna go, among police officers, when I had spoke to educated and respectable police officers that I had known that have been around for a long time that were always um, uh, intelligent and critical of things, and when I asked them, where do we go to find gang members, guess what they said? The same stuff we're saying. The same neighborhoods we said. Jane and Finch, Jamestown, Malvern, Galloway, right? We all knew the areas we have to go into, but we couldn't do that, it's not fair. It's not accurate, but we found these little equitable neighborhoods. So we said, all right, this is kind of a good starting point. Now let's do a comparison here. So what we ended up doing is we looked at the 31, <coughs> sorry, low equitable neighborhoods. And then we did a separate analysis of saying, where do the gang members live that we know of? Where is the gang activity happening? Where is the recruitment happening? Where are the gang crimes happening? And if I were to take those 31 low equitable neighborhoods and I were to take that gang mapping, they're almost identical. And that's not by accident. So now we started to get a bigger understanding of, well, wait a minute, man, there's something else going on here. If you're looking at the police to solve this problem, we had nothing to do with this. And that didn't mean that we're absolving ourselves of any responsibility. What we're saying is, hey, if we're here to find a solution to stop gangs, we got to look beyond arresting gang members all the time. It doesn't work. This has to be a deeper solution. So now we knew objectively, these are the 31 neighbors we're going after. And I don't mean going after in terms of we're going to go in there and kicking doors. We have 31 town halls that we started in September. We're going all the way till the end of March in 2020. And it's in all those neighborhood areas. And what we do is we aggressively go after the community to participate with them in a conversation. And we have them come out to events like this where we host a facility, we have food, we have childcare, we have uh, all that good stuff. Residents come out and we teach them kind of what we know. And then we have a whole off the record conversation in the room where we actually talk about what's happening. And I don't mean in terms of this house is selling dope and that guy's got a gun. We don't want to know that at that stage. It's what are the impacts to a community and to your family every day that nobody else knows about. And some of the insights are heartbreaking or eye-opening and they're very humbling when you actually hear of many of the things that are coming back from these communities. And on top of getting into those communities and identifying positive community members and great social programs to help facilitate family success, <clears throat> we have this exact conversation with them where we said describe a gang member to me and we've done 14 or 15 of them but I can't remember the number of it but I have done hundreds of lectures over the last three years with different levels of government different organizations and this kind of happened organically and in every single one of those town halls regardless of if the population was black brown purple orange or white that description we had of that kid is the exact same description everywhere we go all right, now here's something crazier than that, and this is kind of an insight that we're taking back from it. There are some things that are happening and some neglect that is happening for other communities, all right? So I want you to think about this. If we in this room collectively, and, and this is not to say we're bad, all right? This is just, this highlights a bigger and a deeper problem. And the bigger, deeper problem is what has happened so that black kids growing up in these neighborhoods are the bill for a gang member when we think about it. You're 100% right when you said not all gang members are black. Actually, in Ontario, it's almost tied where we have a certain of it are African Caribbean or black represented. It's about 27 or 28%. And then 26% is South Asian or East Indian. 
And then you move on to different Asian organizations as well as Middle Eastern and different other cultures. We have this gamut of diversity in this room and that same diversity is relayed out into the gang world. But for whatever reason, the entire optics, no matter if you're black or white or orange or purple, the entire optics are that black kids are gang members. Is that fair? Is that a problem? You tell me, is that a problem? What are the, what are the negative repercussions of thinking that? Like globally? Potentially? Sorry, stereotype, 100%. And I want you to think about this. What, what happens when you have stereotypes like that? I want you to, to if, if you were that kid, right, if you were that kid growing up, what does life look like for you? Million percent. Do what in. If everyone in my family is a teacher, everyone's a cop, I'm going to gravitate towards that because that's, that's all I see. So growing up now, having five brothers, and if their dad's drug dealers, and their dad sells guns, and they're showing that to my brothers, that's what they're going to, because they're going to think it's okay, it's cool, my dad did it, his dad did it, his dad, like, it's a generational curse, you know, and I think it's, uh, I have five, I have three, three sons, and I think uh, my biggest thing is I don't want my kids to be a part of that environment. Of course. I do not. No. Oh. And I think it's very important to, um, because I know what I've seen growing up. My, I didn't have a childhood. Mm -hmm. I didn't have one. So my biggest thing for my kids is I want them to have a childhood. So I, I, I have to change how things are, are being done, right? From how I was growing up. Yes. I think when I was growing up, I don't know if I, I don't remember me how to get, get a child, right? As in, like, me, I'm more like, I'm very driven, as you said. I'm, I'm very driven myself. So it's like, I don't want my kids to be on the block when I'm at work. Mm -hmm. 100%. Like, the older gentlemen that are coming to do this. <coughs> Yeah. So I try to keep my kids in sports. I try to like, keep them busy so they don't have to be, because a lot of times a lot of single moms are the kids at home and they're working three or four jobs and that's how the kids get into stuff because there's no one to watch them, right? Look, I'll ask you, you now because this is, this is meant, it's fantastic that you're even in school. All right, so you as a, as a, as a mom, is, is dad around? No. 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 Like, are, are you, listen, are you taking care of the kids 20%? I don't care. My kids, dad is the same mother, they're my four years old. Sure. So. <laughs> million percent but me having three sons being with him for 10 years and seeing that i don't want my kids like that so it's, i i swear to god in my life i make it my passion for my kids to see that that's just not okay and i let them know if this is the lifestyle you're going to choose i show them you're going to go to jail you're going to die because that's the only only thing that's going to come out of you you're not going to become rich you're not going to become a rat like you're going to die you're going to go to jail that's it there's nothing else you understand? Yeah. so let me ask you here all right having that experience you're right in the game of things yeah. this is your life all right so i'm talking about your life what are your obstacles every day that you have to face to ensure that this doesn't happen for your kids i live in a high-risk neighborhood and they're seeing in my neighborhood at least three four times a week my kids can't even go to the park so for me every day is an obstacle but i tell my kids every day like my kids watch movies my sons i don't have girls right because it, like i can't be soft mm -hmm. i have to be like my son did something the other day and i still want my son's not a babe I still have a fear and I still have a problem. I let them know, don't play with me. Mm -hmm. Some are feeling on their boys, right? But I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I let him know, don't play with me. Like, he's, he's a boy. Like, he's, you know, I have to let him know, like, doesn't matter how old you're going to get, doesn't matter how big you are, I'm still your mom. Yeah. I'll come for you, anybody. Like, I let my kids know, I have to be like that because I think a lot of times, like, as moms, you know, you let the kids, your son, you're supposed to get away with a lot of things. Like, my kids are not going to rule me. I, I don't want to, I told my son, I don't want to be your friend, I'm your mom. Mm -hmm. I don't want your kids to be your friend. But I also, there's a relationship with my son is that anything is wrong, he's gonna come and talk to me. You know, I, I don't want him to fear me <coughs> about what I'm doing because I fear my mom, and that's why I said, you know, I just figured out. Know, yes. Listen for. <laughs> no. no, listen, hey, listen. The the fact that you're here, that's absolutely amazing, and you should be really but proud of that. The reason why I'm here in this school, I swear to God, is because I know where I came from. I know what I see. I don't yeah. want to be that. I don't want my kids yeah. to be that, right? It's up to me to change. I don't want to be in school. That's whack. Like at 35, I'm gonna be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna work as a drug dealer. Like what? Yeah. You're gonna buy the house with the drug money? No, we're not doing that. Yeah. So I want to change. You know, I, I wanna I wanna change that environment because that's all I see. That's what I grew up with. I don't want my kids. Listen, the, the hardest part of what you're going through is to walk away. It's not even to walk away. Is to not do today what you did yesterday. Exactly. Exactly. That's the absolute hardest part for anybody that's coming in your shoes right now is to not do today what you did yesterday. 
All right, and why it's so impactful and important that you know that it's, it's fantastic that you're here is because it is, all right? Because when we talk about gang members, and this goes back to exactly what you said, I'm gonna rope it back into what you said. We talked about how do we identify these guys? So we knew the equity neighborhoods, right? Where do we go? What neighborhoods are we going to? We got two for one here. We got low equity, we got gang crime. We know where we're gonna go. The other problem was, what do these people look like? It's not about looks. 2007, Public Safety Canada published a federal publication that said, hey, there's youth gang risk factors. And what these youth gang risk factors said is, and this was provided by PhDs and professors and academics in their field who had dedicated their life to understanding what happens for people from the age of zero all the way up to 18 to become a gang member. What they found all across the world is there are 36 risk factors over five different categories. And these five categories happen at different times, but they're cumulative. And the more of these risk factors that you have, the more likely you are to become a gang member. And if you look at these risk factors, which I don't have the handouts for you today, but if you go to our website, which I'll tell you at the end, it's all listed on there. We have everything on there. We, we, we put it on there. It's right at the beginning. If you hit that risk factors, I'll show it to you. And these risk factors show themselves in different things, but nothing in those risk factors have to do with sex, gender, color of your skin, your background, your ethnicity. That stuff does not matter. And this is going away from the subjective to objective. All right, this is away from what we think is a solution to actually looking at evidence-based strategies to say what is happening socially, what is happening within the mindset, the psychology, the mentality of people from the age of zero all the way up to 18 that pushes them into this lifestyle. And, and we throw out the word gang, all right? That's such a, a catch-all word because it makes stuff super simple. But what do gangs actually do? What, what do gangs do? I'll ask you, like, give, define gang to me. What does that mean for you? It's so many things. You don't even know where to begin. Brotherhood of more than four people. Brotherhood, right? Three or more people conspire to commit an indictable offense or a serious offense for the purpose of money. That's the criminal organization asset of the criminal code that we use to go find these people and prosecute them under. We don't prosecute gangs. We prosecute criminal organizations, all right? But that's the police aspect of it. And once we figured out all these risk factors and we said, all right, there's 36 of them and they happen over five categories, the five categories being family first and then school. And then after school, it becomes your peer group and your group of friends. And then after your peer group becomes friends, you become your individual at the age of 15 and at the very tail end is community. And we know none of that has to do with your ethnicity, your gender, your background, your culture. None of that has to do with any of that stuff. It has to do with psychological things and exposure to gangs and gang violence and criminality and some maybe some learning defects and a drug addictions and all these other things we realize man this problem is deep you do not attack guns and gangs in width you don't just create more strategies to deal with surface level things you have to grow in depth so us growing in depth is acknowledging that this starts at the age of zero so i'll give you an example we end up going to to 2000 frontline police officers in toronto myself and my partner spent six months and we went and we spoke to 2,000 frontline cops in Toronto, and we educated them in a 15-minute crash course to say, hey, look, these are all the risk factors, all right? There's 36 of them over five categories. <laughs> if you read them and you look at them, they all make sense. There's nothing in there that's going to surprise you. Nothing in there that's going to surprise you. And we told these cops in the front line, we said, hey, listen, you got to go out. If you come across a kid in a neighborhood or you have a relationship with a family or you, you arrest a kid and you're like, this kid might be on the path to gang involvement and you got a relationship with this kid or this family, just ask them if they want a different chance. Ask them if they want to do something different. We have to run a few pilot projects with a couple gang kids. So within a week of doing this, we actually had a police officer downtown Toronto uh, in and around that area. And he was totally switched on, arrested a kid, and called us. And he said, hey, man, this kid fits the bill. He's a 15-year-old. This is your guy. He's open to having a conversation with you. So we go up. We have a conversation with this kid. And under the age of 18, we always include their families, all right? And this was the first kid we ever dealt with. And he is the story of since then about 70 kids that we've dealt with over the last three years and this kid's story is is every risk factor marker that you got it's this guy it's a hundred percent this guy and it's a terrible story uh, with the ending yet to be determined but this kid as we talk to him we realize oh man there's there's a few things so his mom comes in we talk to him and we go through the risk factors and what we do is we have a risk factor sheet there's no personal information on there i am dealing with probably about 10 gang members right now that I have no idea who they are. I don't. We do it all through social media. I do it through email. I do it through social media. I do text message. I have no idea who they are. I don't know their names. I don't know their birth date. I just know their rough postal code and their rough age and what their sex is. That's all I need to know. If I know that, I can work with you in the back end. I, we, can, we can figure this out. I just got to know roughly 
where am I dealing with to be able to connect you with some ser services to make your life a little bit easier? So this kid here, he's 14 or 15. He's arrested at a police station. I go to interview him and I've debriefed thousands of people in my life, right? Thousands of them. And uh, it's one of my strengths is talking to people. So I go in there, but in this one here, I'm like, okay, we got to take a different approach because our approach here is not to extract information. Our approach here is to build a relationship to find out what's going on outside of crime. And then how can we plug it? So we have those risk factors. Well, the opposite to risk factor is called a protective factor. And the way you actively deal with these risk factors is you have to treat them individually, right? So if a, if a guy, if a kid, for example, says he has low attachment to school, which is a risk factor, you got to find out why there's a low attachment. Believe it or not, in some of the kids that we have, it's because they've never had their eyes checked. They don't have good vision. They have trouble reading. Because they can't read, they don't even participate. Because they don't participate, they're totally left out of it, and then they get pushed through grade after grade after grade. And once we realize, man, when's the last time you had an eye exam? As stupid as that sounds, and you give them glasses, their life changes. It's as simple as that. Well, we can't just stop there. Well, what's the second thing that you have? What's the other issue that you have? Well, I don't have an attachment to an adult mentor. Why? Because the positive mentors in my life are criminals or gang members, and they have their own issues. Okay, well, what are you into? And one kid in particular, when I actually asked him what he's into, he's a 12-year-old um, kid who's at, uh, severely at risk of gang involvement. He put a knife to a girl's throat in school and said, I'm going to kill you. What? Yeah. At 12. And when we broke it down, as soon as I talked to this kid, he's not a bad kid. He's a 12-year-old kid. He's a 12-year-old kid. And you know what he wanted to do with his life when we eventually broke it down? He wanted to be a French teacher. <laughs> yeah. And you know why he wanted to be a French teacher? Because a French teacher is the only one who gives him the time of day. He has a positive role model that he's not connected with because he doesn't know how to communicate. I value what this is. He's 12. So we just had to connect the 12 year old with the French teacher and say, hey man, this guy looks up to you. And not only that, he values positive language. We all have different languages that we speak, right? For his, it's, it's words of affirmation. He really responds well to positive language. We haven't had an issue with that kid yet for the most part. But with this 14 year old, I wanna get back to him. We get in there and we talk to him. And with his mom, we realize, oh, this guy hits everything on the risk factor chart. So, uh, how many people here have children besides yourself? Boom, 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 boom. Yes, myself. That's why I shave my head now. <laughs> I'm actually 12 years old, but this is the stress I have. <laughs> so, anyways, I want you to think of this, all right? The family risk factor categories. There's about eight of them in that category. And the biggest indicator is that the age of three is when you have that terrible, terrible kid. I mean that kid. It might be your kid. It might be your kid's friend. It might be your niece. It might be your friend's kid. Who you say, yo, don't come into my house. I'll come to yours. All right, we all know what that three-year-old kid is. That kid is a terror. I'm not talking about the one who pees on the toilet seat. I'm talking about the one who punches the toilet seat. I'm talking the one who kicks everything in the house. Like, that's an indicator that something's going on. So we talked to mom, and mom says, listen, man, I was 25 years old. This was my third of, fifth of five kids. She's 25. She's a single mom. She lives in community housing. This is baby number three. All right, and some people said, well, you shouldn't have had that many babies. Listen, that doesn't matter. It's here. That has nothing to do with anything. This is what we're dealing with right now. So let's get out of the you shouldn't have. Let's take a look at what are we going to do from here. That's where you got to sit in your head. You got to say, what are we going to do from here? Stop thinking about yesterday. Stop thinking about 10 minutes ago. What do we do now? Just focus that. So we deal with this mom, and she says, yeah, this kid was, uh, was a pain in my ass from the age of three. This guy was a pain in my ass. All right. And for the parents and, and for those of you who might have younger siblings, I want you to think of this for the parents in the room. You're sitting there. You're washing dishes in your house, and you can hear your kids playing. Is everything okay? You can hear them playing. They're having a good time. Everything's good. What happens? Ah, I'm so it's quiet. And then, yeah, so you're, so mom's like, listen, I'm washing the dishes, and when I hear something quiet, and I'm a dad too, even with my kids, that's when I go into cop mode, right? I'm like, all right, and I am, I'm going to kick in that door. I got you, stupid kids, right? That's, <laughs> well, that's this kid, all right? But here's the crazy part. So we have a whole team of people that help us out in terms of consulting us. One of them is a, is a group of psychologists from CAMH that we reference all the time. So I talked to these CAMH psychologists and they gave me a, a beautiful piece of information which I'll share with you today. And I want you to think back to your own life. And what it is is at the ages of zero to seven roughly, all of our human brains operate on what's called the theta wave. And what a theta wave is, it's almost a state of hypnosis. And in that state of hypnosis, our brains unconsciously is gathering information not to succeed in life, but what do we need to have to survive? So it's not about success, it's about survival mechanisms. So this kid at the age of three, when mom's kicking in that door and he's sitting there with his fist in the toilet, or he's just going to town on it, and mom does what? She yells at him, right? Says, hey, stupid, don't do that, get out of here. So now this kid's already equating something. What happens to babies, newborn babies, when you don't hold them? They die. 
If you don't hold a newborn baby, they will physically die. There's a disease and there's a, yeah, they will die. It's a reaction in the human body. It's about nurture. So yes, that's why in some maternity wards, they have nurses that will particularly hold babies when moms can't. Because if they don't get that nurturing, they die. It's skin to skin is what they call it. All right, so with this kid here, there's something innate in all of us that if we don't get some sort of human connection, we're going to die. All right, that's when you get things like depression. You get anxiety, you get some other things. It might stem from that. So anyways, this kid from zero to seven, he's already firing and wiring in his brain that when I do naughty things, mom gives me what? Attention, right? So now this guy goes from three years old, he goes to kindergarten, and I want you to think in kindergarten for yourself. I know with me in kindergarten, there was two kids in my kindergarten class. I still remember them to this day. I can't wait to pull them over. I haven't had a chance yet. <laughs> but these two kids would just take my lunch sandwich and just punch it, all right? They would just take it out of my bag and just punch my sandwich, but keep eye contact with me the whole time. So that's this kid, right? He goes into kindergarten, and the biggest indicator now in kindergarten is he th he's not successful in kindergarten. That's the difference between passing and succeeding. This kid, he doesn't succeed. He just passes. Because when he goes to school and he's that kid in the class, it's not like he's developed any social skills. His skills are when I cause shit, people give me attention. Now, who's the replacement for mom in a school environment? That's a teacher. So teacher does what? Teachers are angels to me. They change my life. This teacher comes by, grabs this kid, pulls him aside, gives him an educational assistant. Now this kid's isolated from everybody else. All right? Now this kid is feeding that firing and wiring. Okay, when this happens, this is what I do. But kids don't understand that they're doing it. They don't get it. They, I want you to think back now about all your own bullshit behavior. Okay, if you have a spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever, and I said, you know what? This part of you I don't like, I'm not a fan of. I want you to think back to zero to seven for yourself and think about where you learned that from. Think about it. Like, be real with yourself. What are the parts about you that you don't like? Sometimes. But I'm not talking about anybody else. I'm talking about you. Hard. And I'm not asking you to say it out loud because for a lot of us, it's uncomfortable. I get it. I don't want to do that. But I want you to think about that. So this kid now, three years old, pain in the ass, six years old, continues to be a pain at school, gets a one-on-one environment. Now, at the age of nine, what happens with this kid is mom says, what to me? You got so much energy, kid. You got to get out of here. Now, it's the city of Toronto. When you guys were nine years old, were you out playing on your own? No, we weren't, right? Some of us were lucky not to have. When me, when I was nine, I was out on my own. So my parents were just like, listen, when those streetlights come on, you got to be home. Yeah, no, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's like the rule. Yeah. So I'd go play outside. When streetlights come, I'd just book at home as fast as I can, try to jump in out of breath before somebody gives me, somebody gives me some beats. So that's this kid. But when he gets out and mom says, listen, you're going to go play on your own. It's the city of Toronto, man, like you said, moms are busy. She can't, she's got five other, she's got four other kids. This guy's a pain. She's like, listen, you're old enough to go outside, go play in the lobby. And she lives in community housing, so he goes and plays in the lobby. Now this kid's out in the wild for the first time on his own. Does he find people like him or less like him? I like him. Look, this guy's connected with nobody, okay? From even in his own household, he's not connected to anybody as much as he wants to be. Even at school, he's not connected to be as anybody as much as he wants to be. But now he's on his own, and guess what? He found another kid whose mom said the same thing to him. You got too much energy, get out of here. Now he's found three of them, four of them, five of them at the age of nine. And then as he goes on, at the age of 15 in the individual category, this is where we get him now. And he's a full-on self-admitted gang member. He's telling you he's a gang member. There's no secret here. It's not like it's a hidden code and we're trying to solve the Da Vinci code. You know, this guy's telling you when we ask him, are you a gang member? Yeah, I am. And then he lifts his shirt and he's got another T-shirt underneath that has the actual gang name on it. Then he shows you his social media, his Instagram, his Twitter you know, his YouTube channel, and it's all on there, man. It's no secret. I'm telling you, I'm a gang member. Now, these are where things get interesting. So we look back with the mom now. We talk to mom. Say, hey, man, what happened between 9 and 15? And we look at the risk factors, and it all makes sense. So at the age of 8 and 9, when he's out playing on his own, mom manages to get him a bicycle. I don't know how. It doesn't even matter. She gets him a bike. This kid now, he's 8 years old. He's out on his own. He's in a rough neighborhood. He goes out on his bicycle. He goes to get candy. He comes out. What happens to his bike? Gone comes home, tells mom, who busted her ass to get on this bicycle. This kid's been a pain in her ass since the day he was born. Now she got him this. She went out of her way to make this one kid out of all her kids kind of have something productive in his life. And he comes home and he says, Mom, I lost the bike. Somebody stole it. What's her response to him? I wouldn't even be able to get the sentence done before my dad would have just crushed me. Yeah. All right? And, yeah. Yeah, you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's going to start shaking people down old school. Like, hey, where's my bike? Where is it? It's got a Dora flag on the front. Where? <laughs> so that's this kid. Well, he comes home and mom does what to him? Mom says, listen, you idiot. You had one job. You had one responsibility. 
I can't believe it. I did all this for you. You can't even take care of this. A year later, same thing happens. Both times they reported to police. So we have police records for this. And listen, it's the city of Toronto. There's about 90 billion bikes here. There is no bicycle theft prevention task force. You lose your bike here, it's like losing your needle in a haystack. Unless we come across it by accident, the reality is we're not going to get it back. But this bike is of high value to the family, of low priority to the police, because we're dealing with shootings and murders and homicides right now. So there's already a disconnect in the relationship with the police, right? The relationship and the perspective from the family is, police can't even find my bicycle. Why am I going to call them when there's a shooting or a murder? They can't even find my bike. So then now this kid becomes 11, 12, 13, and he goes missing. First time he goes missing, right, because he's with his group of friends. Mom calls us and says, listen, I got four other kids. The street lights said, come on, I don't know where this guy is. He usually hangs around the corner. I can't leave my house. We go, we find him with a group of friends. His wilds find in the other wilds, right? We find him, and what we do is we want to know who everybody is. Only because if he goes missing again, we kind of know who to call. All right, we want to know, hey, man, who's this guy hanging out with? So we, now we collect some information on his group of friends. A year later, he goes missing. The police officer is going to see the mom. Before they go to the mom, they read the last report. They go around the corner. They find the kid with all his friends. So they grab his kid. They bring him home and say, hey, we found him at the same spot last time. And then at 13, he goes missing. This time, he doesn't come home for a week. And when he comes home, mom says, man, this kid's changed. Personality's changed. And then we see an increase in violent offenses. He does robberies. He does theft. Uh, he does car thefts. He does extortions. He does serious violent offenses. Then he gets into drug trafficking. And then now he's at 15 years old, and now we have him in custody at a police facility for drug trafficking. And he's at 15, and as I'm talking to him, a self-admitted gang member. We know his whole life story. And I ask him, and now we develop a relationship. We have a good understanding of each other, which I'll end off with how you do that because it's so valuable. But now we have a good relationship with each other. We have a good time with each other. And, uh, and I say to him, I'm like, hey, man, how did you get roped up in this? Like, what happened? Like, tell me from the beginning. And he tells me. And what he tells me is, the first time he goes missing, or the, he's with a, his crew of friends, and there was an OG in the neighborhood. Right? An OG is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's like an original gangster, old-time gangster, old gangster. It's somebody who's a gang member who's been an established gang member in the neighborhood and is kind of well-respected among, among the community that's, that's gang involved or in that area. Right? He's a really feared or whatever. So this kid says at, the 11, at about 11, there's this OG. And he sees us and he's hanging out with us and we're like, man, this is really cool. You know, we got this. Finally, got a, they got a positive, quote unquote, positive role model that's giving him a little bit of attention. The OG gets him like a McDonald's burger, $1.69, whatever it is. And then the second time he goes missing, he's like, yeah, the OG was here and the OG was telling us to, hey man, go snatch an iPhone off of somebody and then bring it back. And he was gonna reward us. And then when he's 13, he's like, the OG said, listen, you're gonna go do a robbery on a girl in your neighborhood to get her iPhone and we're gonna see we're gonna have a competition that can who can get the most iPhones. So then he gets roped into this and then they get him slinging dope at that age, which is drug dealing. They start him off with a little bit of weed at the beginning. And over the course of years he's getting roped into this. So I ask him, I said, hey, listen, what age do you consider yourself like you were in in? And that they gave you the T shirt and they blessed you and they brought you in and he said twelve. And then when I asked him, I said, Well how old was the OG that roped you in? How old do you think he was? 12-year-old recruited into a gang by an OG in that neighborhood. How old is the OG? He's 16. 16-year-old 16 OG. And when we found out who the OG was, so this kid was roped in at 12, which meant he's 15 now. The OG was 16 when he roped him in. Well, the OG was 19 now, and the OG is a suspect in a murder. So this is a legitimate thing. So we developed a relationship with this kid. We started to try to create blueprints to get him out into something more positive. And what happened is he just stopped talking to us. He wants nothing to do with us. He got arrested very recently. We went in to try to talk to him. He doesn't even want to talk to us. He's not disrespectful. He's, we don't have that type of relationship. He's just, I don't want to talk. I don't force it. I said, yeah, cool, man. This all has to be voluntarily with these people. So he doesn't want to talk, which is cool. <coughs> but one day we end up siding with this kid very early on, about two and a half years ago. We said, you know what? We're going to expand this further. We're still in the test phase. We're still figuring things out. We have a lot of evidence-based strategies and practices that we want to deploy out in this massive stage. We decided to go knock on his mom's door. So we go to his mom's house, knock on the door. Mom answers the door. We said, hey, man, where's the little guy? She says, I don't know. I haven't seen him in like a week. I'm just hoping, you know, this door knock is not a police officer telling me my son is dead. So I said, man, what, what happened? And we sit down. We decide on a whim. We said, hey, listen, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do risk factors with the mom. So we give her this risk factor sheet. And, uh, well, we want to know what's up. We want to see what's the family history, right? 
So this kid had, out of the 36 risk factors, he maybe had 21. How many risk factors do you guys think mom had? Like 29. Okay, so then the question became, mom had 29 risk factors, her son had 21 risk factors, what happened? Why is this guy a gang member and mom is not? We found there was a host of protective factors. But more importantly, what we found was, when we went back to mom, there were some realizations we had there. There's still four of the kids in that household. One of the risk factors is to have a family member who's a gang member is going to greatly increase your chances of becoming a gang member. And guess what? This kid wants something to do with us. He's still 15, man. He ain't going to switch for him anytime soon. All right? It's not, it's not going to happen. But mom, when we said to mom, hey, where do you need help? She was like, oh, thank God. And then we focused on building the mom because I'm not there 24 hours a day. But guess who is? Mom is the pillar of that household. So if we can build mom up, we've greatly reduced the likelihood the other four kids are going to participate in that lifestyle. We've strengthened mom to give her a chance to get out of community housing, maybe get her own two feet for some obstacles she can't get over, such as child care, transportation, food in the fridge, having to work two or three jobs. We're trying to get her updated in terms of her education to make her more marketable in those some fields and get her connected with some good jobs. And when that kid comes home, those days he comes home, mom's there 24 hours. And that mom, now we've strengthened her up, is fantastic. So for us, our gang prevention strategy just totally blew up, totally blew up to how do we get a gang member out of gang to how do we strengthen families that are at risk of producing or having their kids turn into gang members, and that's where we focus all of our attention. And our strategy, before I, uh, before I get out of here, and I'll be done in 10 minutes to give us some of the interest of time. Um, and then and what I'll do is I'll wrap it up in 10 minutes, and then any questions and answers you guys want to ask me, by all means go nuts. You can ask me almost anything, and I'll tell you. But anyways, with this kid here, our strategy, we've broken down to four things. We found in the United States the gold standard model, all right? And what we did is initially when we looked at how do we get a gang member out of gang, we looked all over the world. We looked all over Canada, United States, South America, England, United Kingdom, um, Australia. We looked everywhere and we said, hey, does anybody have a successful way to do this? And unfortunately, nobody has a way of doing this. There's no evaluated way to get a gang member out of a gang. It just doesn't exist. And that's why I said we're getting calls everywhere is because now we're realizing, yo, you got to start from the beginning. But I'll ask you this, is this a police issue? Am I the best guy to, to be able to facilitate these deep psychological, social, uh, mental issues? I'm, I don't have any background in that, man. I, I, yo, I flunked out of university. I'm not the guy for this. I'm aware of what's happening. I'm not the guy for this. Well, this gold model standard we got from the United States, it's called the comprehensive gang model, says, hey, man, if you really want to go after this problem, you have to incorporate every stakeholder that's impacted by this. So let's talk about that kid. Who's the most impacted right now in terms of just people for that kid? It's family. Family's impacted, right? So okay, we gotta get the family on board. Well, that family lives where in that example I give you? Where do they live? Community housing, all right? And community housing, where do kids go and play? When the community housing? Pa hallway, parks, basketball fields, which is parks and rec. And then community housing has security, right? That deals with these people. We gotta bring in security for community housing. And then when they go out, where does this kid start punching sandwiches? Schools, right? So we gotta get schools involved into it. And when this kid commits crime, then we have police involved. But then when you get arrested by police, what happens to you? Where else do you go? Court, right? And then when you're in court, if you get bail, who do you deal with? Probation officers, parole officers, corrections officers. If you go to jail, who's there? Corrections officers, right? You have transport, you have all of these agencies that are impacted by gangs, and that's why I want to ask you at the beginning when we talk about what is the definition of gang, the reason why there's no legal definition of gang to use in a court of law is because there's an acknowledgement across the academic world that gangs impact everything differently. So you can't say that there's one definition of a gang because if I were to ask a school teacher to find gang to me, their impacts of gangs are totally different than ours as law enforcement. Ours as law enforcement are gangs commit crimes. Okay, ours are three or more people that commit or that conspire to commit a serious offense for the purpose of gaining money. That's how we classify these guys. Well, gangs in schools are, from a teacher's perspective, a disruptive student who's in special need of education. Mm -hmm. It's not the same as mine. I can't say a gang to me is the same as a gang to you. And if you go to jails, their definition of gang is completely different. If you go to a family, it's definition is completely different. So the idea is you have to get all these stakeholder partner groups together and identify who is the most impacted at what point and then how can we all support each other to ensure that this doesn't grow. Right? That's where you're going to have the best bang for your buck. When we got asked, I get asked all the time, what does the program look like? There is no program. All right? the, the program is doing this advocacy work. The program is getting rid of some of these stereotypes and really paying a true picture of what it is to get attention where it's needed and where it's not needed. 
So if we're going to focus all the attention on black kids and gang neighborhoods, we're missing a whole population. And in the process of doing that, are we mislabeling a whole bunch of kids that look like that? That example we had of that Jane and Finch kid we're going to give the magic pill to, how many kids would match that example right now if I were to go down there that aren't gang members? A, way more than what we think. Way more kids look like that that are not gang associated. That's their culture. That's just hip hop culture. That's the style of the neighborhood. That's way more people look like that that aren't gang involved than there are that are gang involved. So we got to get that stigma out of here. And that's why we do that conversation at the beginning to say, hey, listen, we're all in agreement. That's what it thinks about. But we got to start changing that thinking. We got to start opening up that scope to say, well, in the process of doing this, are we creating more of a problem? Are we labeling people? Are we pushing people into a, a lifestyle choice that might be above and beyond? Are we doing this to them? And if so, who are we missing in the process? What about the East Indians and South Asians? What about the Asians and the Orientals? What about you know that whole part? What about the Middle Eastern population? They're just getting neglected and their families are being torn apart as well. But it just doesn't get put on the same platform. So we have to do all that advocacy work. We have to bring in all these organizations together to make a massive machine at some point in the next three to five years to determine how are we gonna all collectively get together and deal with this issue? How are we gonna support one another? And here's the part of the police, all right? And this is where we advocate. That kid from zero to seven with about eight risk factors, easy to deal with or hard to deal with? Compared to the 18 year old with 36. Easy, he's a kid. They're already operating at the frequency that we can influence. Okay, so if we can identify some of those behaviors early on, we can, we can really maximize this kid's chance as opposed to when he's a 15 to 18 year old when he's already made up his mind like the kid that we lost. That's where you're gonna get your bang for your buck for the prevention. So prevention, so we have four pillars, all right? We have education, prevention, intervention, and suppression. Education is exactly what doing what I'm doing now. All right, I dedicate one week, uh, one day a week to just reading. I just read academic publications, articles. I make contacts all over the world. I talk to other law enforcement agencies that are in this space, psychologists, social workers, children say it, I talk to everybody say, hey man, give me some insight from what's happening on your end to develop a global picture. And then I advocate that global picture, right? That's part of my one day, that's education. And then it's educating people like yourself, as well as getting feedback to say, you know, what's happening from the community level back out, regaining that education and then redeploying it back in organizations. Well, the second part is prevention. So how do we prevent kids from getting into gangs in the first place? And the best place to do that is from the age of zero to nine. That's where evidence-based strategies being we're gonna do something, we're gonna do an initiative today, we're gonna to have a third party look at what we're doing and evaluate it to say it's successful. All the successful prevention strategies happen from ages zero to nine. And then from nine to 21 is intervention. All right, intervention is a key point that I think everybody misses. All right, a lot of people miss it. We talk about prevention so much. The actual name of our, our, our task force is Gang Prevention Task Force because that's what everybody buys into is prevention. If I put Gang Intervention Task Force, how much of the population is gonna buy into that? Not, but let me ask you here. Gang members are 70% more likely to reoffend than a normal person who's also committed criminal acts. 70% more likely to reoffend. If we're going to focus on preventing kids from getting into gangs, which is a, a, an absolutely necessary part to do by strengthening families and changing the mindset of young kids by developing new opportunities for them and adjusting our interactions with them, what happens to the tens of thousands of people that are either gang members or at risk of gang involvement that are currently in the legal justice system now? What happens to them? They just get left at the up to dry we conducted an intensive gap analysis in the city of toronto on social services and what we realized was after the age of 18 if you're a male after the age of 18 and you get out of jail good luck to you there's nothing for you there's like nothing for you if you're an 18 year old male who got out of jail even if you want to change your life good luck to you it is an uphill battle and you got to be a real special person to make it through and the chances are not in your favor all right, so we gotta look at the intervention. What are we doing to help these people that are currently in the criminal justice system? Not all of them are bad. Not all of them are horrible people. They just are who they became, just like Vic for me. Vic hit this guy, Vic hit all of these risk factors on the head. I just never knew it at the time. But he's my homeboy, I never thought about it. You thought you had to be like tough and thick skinned and everybody was a meathead and, and we never talked about feelings. That had nothing to do with it. You know, that we just absolved any responsibility of talking about how we felt about things. But Vic became that guy, all right? And then the tail end of things is we have prevention, zero to nine, intervention, nine to 18 plus. And then we have suppression, which is where the police, this is where we're kings and this is where we're champions, all right? There was a study done of gangs in Los Angeles. 
or 300 gang members that looked at this one particular gang, and what they realized was that only 10% of this gang was responsible for all of the criminal decision making, which meant 270 of those gang members were gang members, but they didn't commit crimes, or they didn't initiate the initiation of crime. They were just there for the social reasons that we talked about, a sense of belonging, a place to, to go to, a safe space, a collaboration with other people. They were just there, and that 90%, they were in and out of a gang within two years. And when they all got out, they all got out for personal reasons. They either found a girlfriend, they moved, they were a victim of a crime, they saw somebody get shot and killed, they got into high school, university, and in all those cases, with the exception where somebody thought somebody was a snitch, they all left with no re violent repercussions. In fact, the gang was happy for them. Right? They, the core 10% said, no man, you got bigger things for you, go, get out of here, move on. And they did. And that's why you still see them tied to where they're from is because they can acknowledge that, man, my homeboys are still there, they're happy I got out, and they got out. But that remaining 10% responsible for the everyday criminal decision making, as much as we feel terrible for the circumstances for people to become that, you got to be held accountable for what you do. Triggers do not pull themselves. It's the way it goes. And the number one way to combat gang violence across the world, empirically proven, is to arrest gang members. The number one way to combat serious violent crime is to allow the police to arrest the people doing the crime. When we have these town halls, we have 13 of them, I think, or 14 of them. We have one coming up on Thursday in, in Elm's old Rexdale area. And then out of these 14 town halls, we have these conversations, and some of them get super heated, but everybody's there for the right reasons. They always, they, they always end up positive. And we make some great inroads in some of the most gang-impacted communities with some of the most gang-impacted families. And then out of the 14 of them, eight of them, we've had a mother in there who stood up and has said that they found their own kid shot and killed. Eight out of 14. They found, their own kid. they found their own kid. Eight of them have stood up and said, this is what happened to me. And what that does is, is that just sinks us back down to a really anchored position of, you can buy into one of these strategies. I don't say you have to buy into all of them. But the idea is we got to buy into the complete whole picture of understanding that there's whole book circumstances that make somebody a gang member, for sure. And 90% of them are just confused kids that are looking for something. But then there is that core 10% that are going to manipulate kids, that are gonna kidnap and sexually assault women and force them into human trafficking, that are gonna do drive-by shootings and kill an innocent pregnant lady driving through Jamestown. That is my limiting me. I don't think that, mm -hmm. you, like that right there, I swear to God, like that could have been me. Yep. That really bothered me. It, it bothers everybody. It and, and here begins, and here is, here lies the conflict of the space that we're in. Okay, herein lies the conflict. Because as human beings, we're emotional creatures and we're driven by emotion. Emotion is a very powerful tool for motivation, but there has to be an application of logic. Okay, emotion is chaotic. Emotion will drive you to do crazy things sometimes and very passionate things, but we can't convince or we cannot mistake emotion and passion for conviction. Conviction is a very controlled form of belief that we have to adopt strongly here, and we need to be convicted in being objective and gathering an identification and solution for the entire picture here. So with us, when we go out and we advocate to communities and we talk about the absolute innocent people that are shot and killed, and believe me, it's happening now in the city of Toronto. That pregnant lady is one of many. There was a shooting, a homicide recently that occurred in the west end of the city at about 2 o'clock in the morning where a gentleman who has no criminal ties whatsoever lives in a gang impacted community, was walking home and was executed in front of his house just because of where he lived. That's a problem. It's a problem we cannot ignore. It's a problem we cannot make excuses for. That is a problem that supersedes skin color, sex, stereotypes. That's a problem that includes life and death. That's a problem that includes, in our surveillance video of it, the mother running out to find her kid. That's a real issue for us. So in law enforcement, if you're gonna chase that route, you're gonna get into there. My advice to you would be find one of those lenses to become the best at. All right, find one of those lenses to become the best at because to become the best at all four, we're all human beings. There's a reason why I stopped looking at our gang stats. It was really affecting me getting my goal and getting my mission accomplished. It, I want you to imagine this. Imagine you were me and uh, you, know, you were told, Juan, you've got to go work with all these gang kids and these gang families and penetrate these neighborhoods and start developing these inroads and find out what's actually happening and build people up. But at the same time, we need to arrest these guys, 
and I'm going in there to help a 15 or 16 year old kid only to know that the gang he was belonged into did that drive by shooting. How motivated would you be to want to come in there and help that kid? I'm a human being too. Right? And to be honest, I'm not the best person for that. We need to find people that can do that. So our advocacy work is to say, here's the chart from zero to 18 plus. Here are all the people and organizations that need to be involved. How do we all get on the same page with the intent of not arresting people, but the intent of providing alternative outlets for these people as they grow up? Um, it is a, uh, a very deep um, platform. We've run many projects, many initiatives. Out of the 70 kids that we've dealt with, we've only had two that showed somewhat success. And that is because we're in law enforcement trying to re lead this initiative. We're not the best people for it. And we're not stupid about that. We should be the people out there doing what we do holding these people accountable for what they do. Um, that being said, I hope you guys took something from this where you can find yourself for you going forward to tie into. Uh, this is the new way to think coming into law enforcement. Our law enforcement is being aware and acknowledgement of human beings as human beings. We can't arrest our way out of any of these problems. If you're in a position of being a police officer down the road, understand the power of being in that position. Understand the authority and the influence that you have. And for those of you in this room who consider yourself true leaders, and, and we know who we are. Listen, don't, don't be stupid. Don't, don't downplay yourself. All right? Don't do that to yourself because you're doing yourself and all the people around you that look up to you absolute injustice. You know, be objective in what advice you're given. You know, don't pit A against B. Don't do that garbage. That does not work. We might be good guys today, but we're bad guys to somebody else and vice versa. And be acknowledgement, you know, acknowledge all that stuff and work towards it. So, that being said, um, thank you guys so much. If you have any questions, by all means ask me. It's, it's not heavy. Frank, what's going on? <laughs> it feels. It, no, no, no. no. Yes, give, give me one second. Give me one second. Sorry, let me turn this off.